we will discuss policies, whereas on Tuesday, culture and skills, and Wednesday, the institutional change. If you feel you would like to see some of the other recordings, they're all available on the website. Today, uh, RRI and policies with two eminent people as, uh, as a keynote interview, so with two persons really versed in RRI and policies. First, we will, uh, I will say something about Lyndon Farrar, our first uh, guest. He has a background in social science and humanities, and he is a policy officer uh, in the mainstreaming responsible research and innovation sector. Um, and he has worked before for the commission as well in several projects. So he is really a very important and interesting person to uh, look at that, to, uh, to inform us about the questions about research uh, and innovation, oh. the RRI way. Then René von Schomberg, our second interviewee, he has been in RRI, well, since the very beginning, some say he is the inventor, and he has a background in STS, science and technology studies and philosophy. He has been with the commission, well, for more than 20 years. He's now also a guest professor at the Technical University in Darmstadt, Germany. And last year, he published the International Handbook on Responsible Innovation, a global resource. So truly important people to uh, raise some questions about RRI and the future of RRI. So my first question, and that is to Lyndon, is how would you characterize the project of RRI? Would you say it is a movement, it is a program, it is a policy goal, it is a loose set of practices? So sometimes we fall victim to some confusion in terms. How, would, how is it for you? How would you uh, characterize this? Uh, thank you, yes, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, a very good question, of course, because, I mean, different uh, people would probably see themselves, you know, as being part of all of these three different, uh, all of these three different uh, characterizations, a uh, project, a movement, a program, loose set of practices, a uh, policy goal, of course, uh, part of the philosophy of science as well. It comes with all sorts of considerations there too. But I think uh, for me and the way that we've tried to introduce uh, this into the programs is to try and consider it uh, a practice. Um, why is that? Um, because we think that RRI already is um, has a philosophy behind it uh, and we want to see uh, how we can improve research and innovation uh, by putting this, uh, experimenting with different ways of putting this into practice across uh, different uh, projects. Um, I think if we approached it any other way, we would we'd have justifying um, why we're supporting it with, with quite a large amount of money. I mean, we have about 2,000, if not more, projects uh, across the framework program in Horizon 2020 now, uh, which in one way or another uh, take um, a responsible research and innovation approach. Now, in SWAPS, it's well known that we push uh, dimensions. I think the dimensions are very important for institutional change. Uh, and also for providing a kind of kaleidoscope of different aspects that we think are important uh, for the implementation of responsible research and innovation. Um, but what is less widely known is that across the program as a whole, uh, the proxy and the emphasis is put on public engagement. Um, and that's partially because public engagement is much easier for people to, uh, to readily understand. Uh, we're asking people from all sorts of different disciplines, very different jobs, uh, to think about how they can do RRI and, and at some point in time, quite early on, decision was made to come from this. Uh, you'll find in Marie Curie that uh, they pay a slightly, you know, they have a, large, a larger view and it's a bit more in line with the dimension approach. Um, I think in Horizon Europe, if, if I just mention the way that we move, if in Horizon 2020 it's been about public engagement, uh, sometimes it's, it's very downstream engagement, I would say. In Horizon Europe, we focus much more on implementation. Um, I think the focus on co-design uh, and co-creation um, is not really there to stir uh, first off academic debates, but actually it's to put in place practices that can infuse uh, the direction and uh, the content creation uh, of the projects. So I think really this is a I think this is a step change 
uh, what we see with Horizon Europe. We move from a sort of public engagement focus, which is fine, it's important, uh, which can include debate and ethics and all these kinds of things, uh, to one which is uh, even, I think, a bit deeper. I think the idea of co-design and co-creation is deeper than, than public engagement. Uh, so I think if you look at the, the legal uh, hooks for responsible research and innovation and responsible research and innovation practices in, in Horizon Europe, they're much, much stronger uh, than in uh, Horizon 2020. So I think we can expect uh, quite a big step up. Um, probably Rene has something to say as well, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, okay, well, thanks a lot. And it's also reassuring to hear that it's indeed a thousand projects, as you say, and that it's the, the boundaries are a bit vague because sometimes it's on public engagement and, and RRI is maybe less visible, but still it's the umbrella that, that feeds all of them. Uh, Rene, would you, would you like to comment on the idea how to characterize RRI as a movement or a project or a policy goal or, or practices, as Lyndon said? Would you say is would you are are you on his side? Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to join this conversation. I think the idea of an interview is quite good, much better than PowerPoint presentations, I believe. So, um, well, I mean, uh, what uh, Lyndon just said, uh, RI as a practice is, of course, an, uh, an enormous important component, which. Uh, can be facilitated by a funder like the European Commission. For me, uh, as you know, some may be uh, familiar with my uh, with my writings. Uh, on top of this, uh, all I think is something which you did not mention, and that is RRI as a transition towards a new innovation paradigm. And um, it is transition to an innovation paradigm. Uh, various institutions are uh, sub are needed to be subject to change, so to speak, to make this transition possible. And I think it relates to two major uh, changes which we will have to work on, and um, the future uh, um, uh, commission funding program is one element in this. Um, the first change is how um, how we operate in science, and there, uh, you know, as you know, and this has also been subject of your uh, investigations, is the role of open science, where I have a slight correction on your use of the word of open science, because for me, open science is uh, is simply put sharing knowledge and data as early as possible in the research process with all relevant knowledge actors. And so open science has two elements, uh, a research output in open terms, be it data or publications, but also uh, openness towards actors, you know, as a true RI component, if you want to, to say that, but primarily aimed at the scientific community as such to make science uh, more efficient, responsive to societal challenges, and also more reliable because we have two types of crises in science. One is uh, relates to the reproducibility of information of data, and uh, secondly, and this is important for RRI, uh, we have a, a deficit in terms of addressing uh, social relevant uh, uh, subjects. And uh, you know, as a US and SDS professor. Uh, have a long-term experience in, in that area as well. And um, this has to do with how we organize science. So open, the institutionalization of open science will be a correction for that um, as a necessary component of uh, RRI, and not a sufficient one, but a necessary component. Uh, and this, is only make, this will only be possible if we change um, our research behavior. And in order to change research behavior away from uh, publishing as fast as possible and as much as possible towards knowledge sharing as early as possible, we need uh, a, a rewarding system and incentive system for science which rewards scientists precisely for doing that. And now they are punished for th this exactly the same thing. And this is why we have this deficit. Uh, it's one of the five 
major deficits in the global research and innovation system. Uh, so I have still uh, five others, but I only will mention one other one. Um, so this one is very important, and this one is, of course, high on the agenda of the uh, of the European Commission, trying to push uh, notably universities and other funders towards rewarding more research behaviors rather than research outputs. Um, but um, this, and, and now of course, COVID comes in as a gift for open science because when we want to have a vaccine, for example, then it becomes immediately clear to everybody that with a business as usual science, uh, we won't get it. Uh, we only get it if we have a, a thorough public governance, even at a global level, in order to arrange and make scientists behave in a way as we do, not as we want to do with open science, namely sharing information as early as possible. This is happening with COVID, but it only happens if you make all kinds of promises. So if you say to scientists, uh, well, you can, you know, normally they cannot publish on things which are not uh, original anymore. So if they share things early, then they cannot publish anymore. So you have to make arrangements with, with uh, publishers to say, okay, they can still publish after they have shared data, for example. And these are things that are enormously important. The, the other element which uh, also the COVID uh, crisis makes very clear is that uh, that's the innovation part and this is the of RRI and this is the least uh, addressed issue I believe over the last 10 years and that relates to market deficits. Uh, as we all know um, this vaccine will not be produced automatically by industry. Actually they don't have any interest in that as with other major things on earth, you know, like the major disease on earth which affects most people is malaria. And on that, uh, multinationals will not fund anything because they don't see their financial benefits. It's the same with, uh, with a vaccine we have now, we now are subsidizing uh, multinationals with billions of dollars and still they look forward to make a profit out of this vaccine. So we have an enormous market deficit and this can only sh be changed by a socio-economic uh, innovation, which relates to the market as, uh, let's say, a constraining force for technology in terms of uh, a type of ethics which says we should not do this or not do that. For example, we don't clone animals or we don't clone humans, it's forbidden. Uh, this type of ethics which restrains the market, but we don't have incentives for the markets to produce social, social desirable outputs, so things which we would like to have. Now, this is precisely the point again where the Commission also can come in. Uh, the new future on the European, uh, European um, uh, framework for research and innovation is uh, the issues of mission-oriented research. Uh, I, I think I would invite you all to have a look at it in that because it's very important that people from an RRI perspective, uh, uh, you know, start to occupy this type of business because the mission-oriented research is really a change from moving away from traditional funding of key technologies, be it nano or bio or, or things like that in the hope to get economic benefits, which then, of course, in the end, uh, turn out to be an illusion, um, towards a more, uh, social uh, research which is related to a social objective. So unfortunately sometimes these mission-oriented research is sold as, uh, as an issue uh, which um, is something like bringing a man to the moon or something like a technological potential, but this is a misunderstanding what a social mission actually is. It's about addressing social objective with research and with actors to which uh, Linden already um, referred to extensively. So there's this co-creation and co-design which with you, with your project have done some experiments with it is very important. And this also needs to be institutionalized. So okay. I think I leave it by that. I talked yeah. a lot, I think. Oh, sorry, yeah. Howard. Yeah, thanks. So you indeed covered quite some ground already. 
And uh, so you stressed that um, responsible research and innovation should be seen also as a transition towards uh, a new innovation paradigm and, and that could, um, could be a remedy for several deficits. And you pointed out to the, the deficit of the research system, but also the, the market deficit. That's quite clear. That, that, that brings me to my, my question, you already mentioned it, the idea of open science. So some people say, well, the whole term of responsible research innovation has had its peak already, and now we're in the days of open science and we should sell all our efforts on the, under this umbrella. And this is what the commission is into. Um, and so, yeah, so as a provocation, I, I, my question is, would you say that RRI is eaten up by open science or that it really has a, 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 an identity beside that. I, I, I come to, uh, to Lyndon to uh, whether you would recognize this threat that some people phrase and feel or is, is, there, is there hope for RRI as a, as a future label? I, I think both are needed. I mean, for me, RRI and open science, although they, they have uh, quite a lot in common, they're not they're not the same, you know, they have different constituencies, they have different historical trajectories, um, they appeal to different sectors and stakeholders, uh, and they're likely to affect change in different ways. I mean, R is much more about changing uh, the direction uh, of uh, research and innovation and creating visions, you know, and also with open science, we have a very broad approach now, it's very much about this sort of collaborative approach involving all the knowledge actors, as Rene just said, uh, quite a lot of focus on uh, citizen science, things like this. Uh, but open science, I think, you know, most people don't necessarily recognize it in this very uh, wide uh, framing. Um, and, you know, and science, open science doesn't really talk uh, to the innovation community so much uh, either. And, uh, you know, RRI is very much about breaking down silos between research and innovation. And uh, although open science can apply in many cases to, to innovation, and just the term itself is not very useful. So. For me, both are useful. Um, I, I think you can see that open science is, you know, we repeat this term again and again, the modus operandi uh, for Horizon Europe. Uh, this is great. But responsible research and innovation um, is also there. It's mentioned in the legal texts uh, in at least two or three places. And I think what you'll find is that RRI has influenced um, a lot of uh, the architecture uh, of Horizon Europe without mentioning it by name and perhaps this is the way that you can have the most effect because you know the terminology RRI is off-putting to some and you know and other people don't understand what it is it's too complicated but instead we put focus on on RRI related kind of concepts and activities and you know the missions approach uh, if you look at the ex-ante uh, impact assessment uh, it pretty much says that uh, RRI is going to underpin the approach to the missions you know so this is the way that we've approached it, as we've seen that uh, RI also within the commission is not always finding uh, the full support that it uh, that it might do, just like all concepts. Uh, we find other ways to promote responsible research and innovation. So I don't see a threat here, really. I, I see that they're both uh, complementary. Um, perhaps in the future, there'll be a new, the emergence of a new, uh, more unifying concept that takes into account both, you know, open and inclusive research and innovation or something like that. Maybe that's not even necessary. but. At the moment, I don't see the threat. I, th I think it's uh, it's positive to focus uh, on both. Okay, good. That that's also reassuring. Um, I'm sure Renee has a lot to say about that, but I, I I will skip that because I have some other questions for you as well, Renee. Um, so we are in this final summit of Fit for RRI, which which was focusing on how to implement it and how to make uh, tools and and training for. Um, for, for research and funding organizations. And well, there's also sometimes the critique and the worry that if we develop it too much into tools and toolboxes and, and trainers and uh, that it instrumentalizes and that it becomes a sort of list of, uh, of a checklist so that the reflection that is needed for RRI is then a bit um, pushed to the background. Would, would you agree with, with this risk? Do you see this happening as well? Because there are many of these projects. We heard about RAISE, we heard about uh, the, the uh, toolboxes for RRI. Would you say there is a, a tendency to, be, to, to make it a bit more instrumental and, and to have a checklist instead of reflection, Renee? 
Um, yeah, it's a good point, uh, Haro. Um, I, I think uh, one needs uh, all of that a little bit, of course. I mean, uh, everybody wants a reflection and everyone's, uh, everyone also wants to have practice. Um, but uh, for me, yet again, um, there is something which goes a little bit beyond those things to make it possible. Um, and, you know, I have, I have dubbed this already in 2007 in a working paper, which actually led up to the notion of the RRI. Um, that's about the organization of what I call collective co-responsibility. And uh, this uh, means that, um, you know, as we just discussed a little bit the differences between open science and um, RRI, uh, you know, Lyndon rightly pointed out that RRI is about giving research and innovation a direction. This is what open science not necessarily does. And how do you how do you organize research and innovation in a way that you give it a direction? For example, uh, make it possible that vaccines will be produced like we did with Ebola and in. Uh, and in Sika in an early phase, but we use it as an exceptional uh, thing rather than a standard practice. Now, how do we organize a standard practice for this? And this is um, where it comes to the tools. So for example, I mean, this is where I'm a criticist. Criticist, uh, sometimes I call myself, uh, I'm, you know, you know all these statements, and Marx, uh, sometimes I've said I'm not a Marxist, so sometimes I say I'm not an RRIist, because, you know, when it comes to, to ethics, it's not about um, that researchers, uh, you know, within a particular practice will have to climb a higher moral ground in order to do RRI. This is ridiculous. Uh, what we want to do is organize a practice so that RRI becomes institutionalized and that any researcher independent of, of uh, its own uh, moral uh, uh, or ethical uh, motives will practice RRI. And this is only possible if you organize it. And this is part of the transition of the paradigm. You can only institutionalize this if uh, funders will reward, for example, the constitution of what I call knowledge coalitions, knowledge coalitions between different actors, and you force them to become that you, you force them, so to speak, or you incentivize them to become mutual responsive, you know, which was part of my original definition of RRI. And this institutionalization is very important, and this is also valid for the market economy, market science policy interface, which is insufficiently addressed yet. Although there are brilliant projects under swaps, for example, uh, probably uh, Lyndon knows more of detail about, it. for instance, the PressMart project, which contributed to new RRI standards for companies, for example. But this is also this; they are working on a sort of institutionalization of collective co-responsibility, where then, of course, all the tools can come in, and but. For me, uh, you know, of course, I'm a philosopher. I look for this side, you know, we have, to we have to rearrange our institutional settings here. And then all these elements, what you say, a reflection, of course, but I mean, like uh, Richard Owens and Phil's uh, McNaughton's definition of RRI, which is very process oriented, I can all agree with, but it's not sufficient uh, for me, so for me, it's it's. I am a sort of uh, strong RRI in a sense. I want to uh, work on the transition to this new innovation paradigm, which requires more of these actors. And this is why we also had this open science policy platform since 2016, which was backed by all member states uh, to work towards uh, another system for science to operate and. Of course, we only make relative successes there because there's a lot of inertia. I mean, you know it from your own university. So, um, I, so I leave it by that because I have the tendency to talk too long. You can stop me, Haro. <laughs> well, it's it's always worth listening to you. So, uh, but uh, what I what I uh, what I find interesting is that you talk about strong RRI. And that that suggests there's also a weak RRI. I'm not I'm not sure whether you would like to make a, a dichotomy in the field <laughs> and define some new churches here. Um, 
but but I find this an interesting. No, no, no. I, I don't want to do that, Harold. Oh, that's, okay. that's, uh, that's a mistake. What I wanted okay. to highlight is that I I I I I think it's important to reflect on these institutional changes. And as you mentioned in your first question, in a certain way, uh, responsible research and innovation is a socio-economic innovation as well. So it's in a yeah. it's, it's yeah. on that level and this is where all the other elements like collective core responsibility changing the modus operandi of science changing the mark uh, you know addressing the market deficits uh, and so on and so on becomes important and then in, in 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 you know in the stream of this all these other elements you have mentioned with with, with your tools and things you do with fit for ri they're of course all relevant they belong they are part of it but they can only work effectively if we work on, on, towards this transition. Yeah, yeah, I see that. So I, I will ask Lyndon then. So this um, this enormous uh, amount of uh, instrument instruments that have been developed. Would you say this is um, somehow um, apart from very useful, also maybe a risk that it loses sight of where, where it is. I mean, you, you heard the ideas of, of René that in, in, in the end it should be towards transition, mm -hmm. uh, but it can also, it can also paralyze people uh, that there are so many tools available and which one to use. And, and uh, is there any, some of those concerns with you as well? Or would you say, well, it's usually, uh, usually quite useful that we all have these tools and, and trainings uh, and, and so on? Mm, it's, a, it's a good question uh, because of course there are a lot of different tools out there for lots of different purposes. Um, I think, you know, with Science Within for Society, uh, the idea was to really start piloting this approach to getting institutions to open up uh, to society. Um, and later on there was a particular emphasis put on the sustainability uh, of these kinds of changes. I think with these kinds of projects, uh, that you've seen throughout the last seven years. Uh, there's a lot of piloting, there's experimentation, there's case studies, uh, and it makes a lot of sense to create handbooks and tool books, uh, things like this. Uh, at the same time, there's been a lot of focus on the empirical uh, practice, uh, building theory, hopefully from the practice, not necessarily only the other way around. Uh, you know, and this is also very important. Uh, but I think what we've also seen is that, you know, the RNI system is, is a big uh, beast. It's difficult to, to get it to move. And the small amount of funding uh, that we can provide in Science Within for Society and moving forward in the, in the era part, uh, which uh, is really sort of a successor to SWAPS uh, in some ways, uh, means that we need to approach this in a different way. And I think it's a good point in time uh, to start consolidating this. You know, I think we, we have this evidence base, we have practitioners, we have uh, experienced organizations, uh, and we have the legal text pushing in this particular direction. Uh, and we really need to scale up these experiences to many more organizations. We need to get better value for money uh, out of this uh, as well. And I think with the, with the era part, this is something that we really need to try uh, and focus on. It's, it's really sort of valorizing all of these toolkits. Maybe some of them aren't used in name, but the learning of them should come into some kind of consolidated approach. Um, and we need to find ways to support institutions, uh, maybe not through the traditional uh, project funding of two or three million over three years to do something, but perhaps through, for instance, cascading grant where you have uh, kind of business support uh, that provides services uh, and consultancy uh, and, and sort of holds the hands of institutions that are interested in, in making these changes. You know, it shouldn't just be about receiving the money. The institutions need to see that it's something useful for them. And I think with Horizon Europe, we've created an incentive there to really open up because they'll have to do it a lot more to participate uh, in the widest range of actions that there are. So I don't really see a, a trade-off. I can understand that there's a worry that, you know, we have 15 toolkits on this and five handbooks uh, on something else. Uh, but I think all of this adds to the evidence base and the practice base that we can that can be made use of uh, later on. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I, I have a, uh, a question that is related to that, and you're already pointed to this community of practitioners. So indeed, we are convening here now as a community of practitioners. And on the one hand, that is 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 good that that we have people who who somehow dedicate their thinking and their practice to to RRI. On the other hand. You would not like to see a sort of task division where RRI is being the task of the RRI practitioners and the others can just go on with business as usual. That is 
would be self-defeating. So how, what would you see as the task of, of a community of practice of RRI as we are now convening here? How would you see that, Lyndon? Uh, well, of course, the community itself can only really answer that. I mean, from my perspective, you know, we've given an, an injection of money here to, to build up our own science within Paul Society and Horizon 2020. Uh, and really, it, it would be really good to see this community uh, be able to influence and cross-fertilize other thematic areas now. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to bring experts together and to focus, but it's also important at some point to reach out and to say, look, we have the tools, we have the means of doing things better rather than starting from scratch. And I think if we want to see uh, the kinds of successes that the missions are talking about, we really need to have this RI expertise in there. The same goes for the clusters, but, but of course, that's, a, you know, the, that's not taking quite the same portfolio approach that the missions would have. Uh, I don't know how many people have seen the Green Deal call, which came out uh, very recently. I think in a way it's, you know, it's a model for how RRI and open science and societal engagement uh, can really be very well integrated in thematic areas. Um, uh, if you look across the, uh, the 10 or the 11 different areas, uh, there's an entire part which is related to societal engagement, that's fine, but you also see it elsewhere. You see references to uh, responsible research and innovation, the Mori indicators and things like that. So for me, the challenge would be to try and break out. Of course, there's a challenge for us within the commission as well to try and ensure that the programs reflect uh, the legal ambitions that have been put down because the legal provisions are very strong. Uh, but of course, we have inertia as well within the institution. So we need to constantly remind and constantly open it up to the RRI community. But it, it takes both uh, to make this work. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, so let's continue on that base then. Um, and as we are a, uh, a community of practitioners and, and thinkers on RRI, we also have some people uh, intervening with the chat and having some questions for you as well. So I, I have a question here from uh, Anne Marie Forsberg to, uh, to, I think, especially Renee, where you would say, um, yes, there could be a transition to a new innovation paradigm. But what about the European Innovation Council? It is about potentially extremely socially sensitive technology breakthroughs, but there is hardly any RRI there. What to do? So do you, do you recognize this concern, uh, René? It's a new question, but it's, uh, um, and maybe you feel a bit not in the situation to really respond to this, but well, no, say as I, much I, as you can. <laughs> okay, no, uh, I, I do, uh, I, I have the same concern actually. So uh, we, we share that as an uh, RRI community, I believe. Um, well, I think what, what, what's, what's valid for the framework program is valid for the Innovation Council as well. Um, we have to deal, of course, with a certain, um, let's say, you know, if you look to the legal arrangements of, of what we now have in the new framework program, in my view, the theory is quite good. We have a responsible research as innovation as an objective, much stronger actually than just a cross-cutting issue because it means that everybody has to align with it. So also the Innovation Council. But then the question is, will it then actually happen? <laughs> so uh, so this will of course only happen if, if um, and, and this is actually where the research community which we have built with these projects under SWOFs, I think is so important because as you rightly say, we have now an RI community and we have built it up in a very short time. I think this is a major success as such, you know, independent on what the individual projects now deliver or not delivered, you know, but it's a success that we have created this community and it's very important that this community uh, keeps um, keeps uh, targeting also, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, institutions such as the Innovation Council or even the ERC, uh, which of course have to one way or another comply with. Uh, uh, you know, with uh, things from bureaucrats as us to say, well, you have to do RI whether you like it or not. So, but the problem is, of course, that you cannot do uh, these things properly if people are not convinced uh, by it. And uh, funding, especially at the European level, is applicant driven. And if 
ap applicants uh, uh, don't understand uh, the uh, the elements of RRI or open science well, then then it may fail. So this is why I think uh, with this uh, community which we have built, uh, which you know I, I I repeat again, I think I'm very happy with that. That's that I uh, you know regardless of differences of opinion, we do have this community. And this community can also engage itself with all these uh, other in institutions and other elements. Uh, because now you have a legal basis to do it. It's not just like in the past where RRI was a, was an, um, a voluntary thing, you know, where applicants they say, well, we want to do it and we can get funding for it. Now there is a framework we can refer to it. There is a legal basis. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, but of course, we are dependent on who will implement it, and and this is of course the, the critical moment. I mean, um, uh, things can be implemented badly with a good theory, or the other way around. Uh, uh, funders like the Commission cannot determine uh, the practice. This is up to the applicants. Yeah. Okay. Good. So. Um that that brings me to to the point of of well where we are now and currently we we are in the pandemic situation of covid-19 which is shaking up the research system in all kinds of ways so we would instead of meeting each other we have conferences like this on zoom uh you will see that people uh change the, the their field work because uh, they have to change their plans uh so it's yeah, for good or for worse, the, the, the system is shaken by COVID-19. Um, and René, you already said something about the open science and, and how that creates opportunities. Um, so my question to Lyndon is, would, would, you, would you say there are other opportunities that are now available for RRI because we have this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I mean, it's good to reflect on where we are now and whether, whether we could also make something productive out of out of the unfortunate situation. Do you um, have any well, ideas? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a million dollar question or million euro question. Exactly. Uh, I don't really like to think of, of, of opportunities coming out of the crisis, um, but I, I know what you mean at the same time. Um, also, uh, I'm afraid I don't really want to second guess because I think you know a lot of this hinges on, on what on how long this lasts and whether we're able to, to rise to the challenge and whether there's any terrible mistakes or, or unforeseen uh, you know, things down the line for us. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's shown that we're you know, unprepared for the most obvious uh, issues. I mean, uh, several, you know, many reports have shown that pandemic is one of the most uh, likely uh, sort of disasters that could uh, befall uh, society. And uh, there's been warning signs throughout and haven't really been listened uh, two in the same way that they might have done. So there's all sorts of uh, there's issues all over. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention for, for anyone who's uh, who's not aware is that uh, we will have a Eurobarometer uh, probably next spring, um, following in the long uh, tradition of the science and society uh, or public opinion about science kind of surveys that have been going on for decades now. Uh, we tried to build some time series there on knowledge and views and ethics around science. Uh, but we also put the emphasis um, even more on the sort of co-design, co-creation elements. Uh, and it could be quite interesting to see what the results show, because of course the Eurobarometers are in some, you know, arguably sort of gold standard evidence about what, you know, people's interactions and understandings uh, and feelings about the value of science. So um, I prefer to wait until the results are out of the Eurobarometer before saying whether I think uh, it's, it's, it's creating uh, you know whether it creates a real problem for science or whether it's an opportunity uh, moving forwards. Yeah, Rene, would you uh, would you add something to to how to respond to the current situation and and not just be the victim but also try to make something better out of it? You're muted, Rene. You're muted. Okay. So um, thanks, thanks, Sahara. Well, you know, um, I, I'm just in the course of an article with some colleagues of yours, um, and uh, I really want to um, emphasize that the, the the whole idea of RRI and its implementation is an unfinished project. I mean, we we are only halfway there, or maybe uh, only thirty percent. 
uh, but we did make some enormous steps forward in the recent, uh, let's say, 20 years, different components, and we learned from how to deal with new technologies in a progressive way. Uh, there are some dark sides on the horizon, horizon of course, uh, you know, nationalistic tendencies, lack of global governance rather than strengthening it, the latter we actually need for RRI and open science at the global level. So, um, you know, we, we are moving in this spectrum, but I say that, I, I would say still that there is a real positive uh, change over the years. Of course, there are some uh, fallbacks now and then, but it's an unfinished project. Uh, you know, as we already mentioned, you know, Rise in Europe in itself, the theory is very good. The applicants have to make use of it. The community has to uh, keep engaged. Uh, and then I think I'm confident we can do it. I, I think on the different elements, like uh, the progress of open science uh, will happen. Uh, now with, with the help of COVID actually, I hope that post COVID uh, there will be also more definitive changes in other areas. On the issue of market deficits, I'm a little bit uh, less optimistic, uh, but uh, I think uh, some neoliberal ideas has really come to an end. So also there uh, you, see, uh, you see changes. So I think we have to keep on, keep on working uh, together. Okay, okay, so we're, we're coming to the end of, um, of our encounter and the, um, the dual interview. So if I take that one step further, Rene, um, so what, what would you be your advice on proceeding RRI from where we are now, given what we have uh, in academic uh, underpinning and our set of examples and approaches? What is the step forward? What, what would you advise this community to, to do now? And uh, well, of course, there are many things to do, but what would be on your top priority list? I think the top priority for me would be to, um, to popularize uh, the mission-oriented approach uh, for research. I think this is your natural client. Um, and this is where it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's happening. I mean, virtually all the elements of RRI are formally included in, in, in the programs of the missions. They are, they are co-created, they will be co-designed, citizens will be, uh, will be given input to define research agendas. Um, you know, but of course it's a matter of the quality of implementation we'll have to see. Uh, and it will be done on a scale this we have to realize, it will be done on a scale never practiced ever before in the history of mankind. This type of mission-oriented research also doesn't exist anywhere else and only at the European level. So this is a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. And so if, this, if only one or two missions will succeed in terms of addressing social objectives and giving direction to innovation, then we have great examples to build on that because we need examples of good RRI. We have still too little. We have, this is, was the weakness of the SWAPS program I mean, we, to some extent. We did not deliver on, uh, on giving directions towards innovation. And this the missions can do. This is your first objective. And the other one I think is around the society, social, uh, on, around the SDGs, you know, consistent with, with RRI, um, research will become value driven. It's now even advocated by our director general. So that's really a paradigm change in our institution. Uh, I mean, our former uh, Dutch director general would never say that. So there is an, there is an, there is a, so also a change in the bureaucracy towards these things. Uh, and I think um, this is an enormous help. So we are now in a situation where quite some political actors, and, and this we need, this is around missions, this is around political actors as well, they are behind us. So we have to use this opportunity. Uh, so uh, use this community to go after it. Don't let it be done only by uh, technicians. Okay, so that's a very clear message. And also, uh, well, it really gives uh, some encouraging spirit here. Linden, would you uh, would you add something to that, or, or would you just agree with uh, Renee? Well, I 
Of course, I agree with what Rene said. I mean, yeah. it's an important point. So, you know, I think it's a window of opportunity here. Um, we can try and keep this window open as widely as possible, but it's there at the moment. I think it's there for the taking. Uh, we try to, you know, so I think it's important to try and implement RI outside the RI community. Uh, there's, there's one thing, there's one risk associated with this. You know, we start seeing the draft work programs of the entire program being developed now, and we, we are having a look at this internally. Uh, and I'm struck with the fear that actually is there capacity within the you know the RI community in its wider sense. You know, here I'd also include the citizen science community. I'd, I'd, I'd call participatory research, uh, civil society. Is there capacity uh, within society uh, to live up uh, and step up to this challenge? You know, that is my my slight fear now that we've created all these opportunities. Um, because we know that uh, this, we're convinced that this is the better way of doing research and innovation, responding to the challenges. Um, but perhaps, you know, we're asking too much. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe one answer there would be think about capacity building, think about how you can prepare uh, for this. Because, of course, if you have excess capacity in your organizations and your community, you're able to respond uh, better at the same time. Of course, this is just a fear, it may not be well founded, but. Um, it's just something to, to throw out there. Perhaps now is a good opportunity. Okay, so we are really heading towards the end and I really would like to uh, thank you both very, very much. It's helpful for us when we uh, work on these issues to, to have some encounter with people from the policy making areas. And uh, it's also good as we are approaching the end of this program that, um, that we think about there are many many more possibilities for next steps and uh, it's good to hear that it's well it's we're still underway it's maybe not even halfway so and uh, and I also fully agree there are so many challenges ahead uh, not also not just in terms of, um, of big programs but also in terms of societal challenges they well um, yeah science and technology is too good to leave it just to engineers and uh, well we should make sure that there is societal engagement and direction and reflection. So, thanks a lot. And um, um, well, I'm not in the in the opportunity to give you a bottle of wine or something, but I really <laughs> uh, can assure that people enjoyed uh, having you here. And uh, we will continue with the program at half past uh, ten, so people could um, leave this meeting and log in to the next sessions, session two or three. So um, yeah, it's now shown by uh, by Pedro. So thank you very much and um, see you thank in the you. next sessions. Great, thank you Aro. So yeah. I will try to find a way to offer a, a bottle of Portuguese wine. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I will inform you about that later. Okay, so please join the, um, the session so we can we have a break now for um, three, four minutes. Uh, we are already sharing the links for this session. So we will have two parallel sessions starting at um, half past 10. RRI is a cross-cutting issue and man, uh, mainstreaming RRI in the, in the European research area. So um, uh, choose your session and, and join. So the links are here in the chat and uh, are also, of course, in the, um, in the web page of the program. So nothing changed for these links, only we only had an issue with the link for the first session. So be aware of that and join the, those, uh, one of those uh, two sessions. Thank you. So be, be free to, to, to close your, your, your session arrow. Uh, we will keep this open just for uh, some minutes to inform people about the, the other two sessions, but you, you can close the problem.